So if you really think about true sportsmanship, it has a lot in common with the Christian values. And I believe when you discover your vision in life, you're willing to die for it. Not live for it, but die for it. When I was 17, I saw myself at 75. So vision will give you discipline, it will give you a passion, and the third thing it will do, the most important thing, it will attract other people. Is it possible that passion could turn into the obsession? God always gives you a vision that you could never do without Him. I am God, there is none else. I make the end before the beginning. So I said God finished my life, then He gave me birth to start it. You sound like at least 60 years old. <laughs> your purpose in life is whatever you'd rather be doing. How do you feel when you see your, uh, your picture all over Seattle? I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I feel good. Yeah. Today our program is will be dedicated a lot to sport. We're not at the gym, we're not at the field. We're the Church of Christ who called not to worship ourselves, but only our Lord and Savior. But if you think about the true sportsmanship, it's a lot more than just building up your body, <laughs> building up your career, become famous or rich. It's about passion. It's about discipline. It's about sacrifice in constant battle with challenges. So if you really think about true sportsmanship, it has a lot in common with the Christian values. And that's what this program will be about. And I'm very excited to welcome our special guest, Steve Zakwani. So let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much. Steve, uh, obviously you're a very dedicated player. At what age you knew you will be playing professionally? I began playing when I was five years old, but when I knew I'd become a pro, I was nine years old. Wow, nine years. At nine years old, I signed with Arsenal FC, which is one of the top teams in Europe. And to get that contract at nine years old meant the world to my family. And so when I was between nine and the age of 14, 15, I was signed to Arsenal FC. And so in school, my levels dropped, my trying in school dropped. The teacher said, do your homework. <laughs> and I said, I want to be like Thierry Henry and Thierry Henry doesn't do homework. He plays soccer, <laughs> so I want to play soccer. So I would sometimes skip school to play soccer. And that's a bad thing when you look at it now, but it showed you how much I wanted to be a pro. And so I had a few setbacks, but at the age of 21, I did sign a professional contract, and I've been a pro for three years now, but it's been a dream in my heart for about 12 years, 12, 13 years, a serious dream. And so it's amazing to wake up and live your dream, and I'm experiencing that every day. The reason I'm asking this question, we have many people that are very gifted, talented, but yet they get nowhere in their life, except maybe lying down on the couch and playing Xbox, and that's the place where they win their trophies. Yes. Why do you think that? I believe that when I, when I was 17, I had an encounter with Jesus Christ in a way I could never imagine. And when I began to live for God, I discovered something very important. I discovered that most of the people we call leaders, from Abraham Lincoln to Nelson Mandela to Michael Jordan to Barack Obama, all these great leaders, Mother Teresa, not one of them took a single class in leadership. Not right. one. And we call That's them leaders. So what makes them leaders? Then I read their books, and each one of them had an experience at a young age. And the experience it had a vision wow. of what they were born to do. And I believe when you discover your vision in life, you're willing to die for it. Not live for it, but die for it. Mandela died for his vision for 27 years in jail. Teresa's vision killed her. Jesus Christ's vision killed him. And so my question was, are you willing to die for what you're living for? If the answer mm -hmm. is no, then you're gonna be like you said, lazy and sleeping. So regardless how gifted uh, you are, if you don't have that vision, if you don't have that dream, you don't get nowhere in It will life. never happen, and the vision is ignited by passion. When you become so passionate about what you see in your life, it overcomes any obstacle, any obstacle. Some of the greatest people in the world had the hardest setbacks, but their passion was stronger than the setback, and so wow. they pushed through it. If you have no passion and you meet a setback, it's gonna stop you. But if you're so passionate about it, you're gonna go through. Like right now, I'm dealing with an injury. But so that's where you get the drive strong. to overcome all of those obstacles is from that, that passion. That's what wakes you up in the morning. 
So for even if you have a headache because you have the passion, you're inspired to go through all of those obstacles. It wakes up and it makes it worth it because you've already seen the end. Mm -hmm. When I was 17, I saw myself at 75, what I'd accomplished in my life. And so if at 22 I meet an obstacle, I know this is only temporary because I've already seen the end. And the verse that helped me do this was Isaiah 46, verse 9. It says, remember your form, the former things of old. I am God. There is none else. I make the end before the beginning. So I said, God finished my life. Then he gave me birth to start it. The fact that I'm here is good news. Mm -hmm. It means it's already finished. Right. So I ain't got nothing to worry about. We all talk about the vision, 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 but I want people to understand. So uh, just put one, just one, two, three. Why is it important to have vision? Number one, it, it gives you inspiration, gives you the drive to go through the different difficult times in your life, right? Yes. Where else? Yes. Number two, vision gives you something worth dying for. And when I say dying for, I don't mean literally death. You die to other options. For example, when I used to run home at 15, I could have gone to the streets and played with my friends in the grass. I could have played video games, could have done all kinds of stuff. But my vision kept me disciplined. So prioritize. Prioritize. Where there is no vision, the people perish, the Bible says. That's right. They, there's no discipline. So what gave me discipline? Even in college, for example, I went to college, and college is temptation island. <laughs> but I was, I was kept pure because I had a vision. It gave me so much discipline. I knew what I needed to do. So vision will give you discipline. It will give you a passion. And the third thing it will do, the most important thing, it will attract other people. Mm -hmm. I believe in life people don't follow people. They follow vision. We didn't follow, or they follow your gift. We didn't follow Tiger Woods. We followed his gift. He's going up and down that green, and we're walking up and down with him. We're not, uh, we don't like him. We like <laughs> his gift. The right. same as me. People don't really like me. They like my gift. And so vision is very important because it attracts people towards you. And when you get an audience, you can tell them about Christ. And that's my vision in life. My vision is beyond soccer. Soccer for me now is nothing. This is, I want to I wanna go back home. Platform. And, yeah, platform. My dream is to build a school, an academy for wow. teenagers in London where they will come and live for a couple of years and we'll teach them the Bible. And then we'll send them out into different soccer clubs around the world so they can be influencers. That's what drives me. That's my, I found my thing to die for. I would die for that. So it's a mistake if people think, well, he's so gifted. That's why they're jealous for your gifts. But in reality, the reason, uh, the reason they, they get somewhere, just like you said, Abraham uh, Lincoln and everybody else, is because of that vision. vision. So that everybody could have that. Every because gift, you might be limited, yes. but everybody could have the dream that they so desire and they just go after, right? I believe every single human being is born with a gift. We come to earth with a gift, and your job in life is to serve that gift to the world. When you discover that gift and you decide to serve it, that's what makes you a leader. Leadership is not learned in university, it's not learned in colleges, it's not learned in courses, it's discovered in your gift. And when you say, I'm going to do everything I can to get this out of me before I die, I'll be a leader. Look how Jesus died, age 33. He wasn't old, 33 right. years old. But his dying words was, it is finished. He died empty. It's all gone. I'm done. My gift is on the world. And so my goal in life is to die empty. Leave nothing yeah. left. When you discover your gift, I believe you become a leader. And everyone has a gift. The scripture actually says, a man's gift makes room for him in the world. Not your education your gift. So discover what God gave you. What you're unique about. What only you can do that no one else can do. What drives you? What motivates you? Um, the way I ask people is this. Your purpose in life is not hard to find. Your purpose in life is whatever you'd rather be doing. If you're sitting in an office, but you'd rather be owning a restaurant, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Once you get to the place where you'd rather be nowhere else, you've arrived. Right now, I'd rather be nowhere else than this chair, so I've arrived. Right, right. So, you sound like at least 60 years old. <laughs> my kids, what's the question they, they want me to ask you? Oh, yeah. In my smallest chair, he said, ask him how old is he? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 23 years old. Wow. <laughs> You're too smart for that age. Yeah, I read a lot. I read a lot. I have a passion for reading. Uh, I have a challenge to myself to try and read four books every month for the last six years. Sometimes I fail, but that's my challenge. So I read all kinds of books, and I just want to get knowledge. I want to wow. know. But yeah. you're talking from your experience. From my experience. So yeah, this happened. Yeah. I, I never used to read. Before 17, I met the Lord at 17, or the Lord met me at 17. Before 17, didn't pick up a book, never read, didn't study in school. I left school. I dropped out of school. I didn't finish school. And when I got, came to the Lord, the, one of the first verses I read was, 
the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, exactly. And yeah. so I made a, a, a dedication in life to get knowledge. I want to know. I don't want to be ignorant. I want to know what to do. And so I mm -hmm. read a Bible every day. I read all kinds of books to help me in my quest for Christ. And I encourage people to definitely get into books. Re leaders are readers. They read a lot of good books. Okay, so now let's go back to your, to your child years. Yes. So you're nine years old. Then you have a dream. Okay, I want to... I want to play as a pro uh, soccer, this, this beautiful game, yeah. which I'm a fan of this. Yeah. But then, the, didn't you realize back then, at your age, that how many millions of people want to qualify for that one spot, yeah. and you were not afraid to dream? You were not afraid to put that vision before yeah. you? No, it was, it's what drove me. Um, I came from a very rough, I grew up in London, but it was a very poor neighborhood. Very poor, we didn't have much, lots of crime. But what kept me from going into crime and going the wrong way was I had this vision. And even before I met the Lord, the vision gave me discipline. And so... So got you to, uh, all the way from your guts. Oh I just, God, I you have, have to do, do it. that vision. I would go to soccer games in the stadium, watch my role models, and I'd say, that has to be me one day. I have to do that. And that was my vision. At age 15, I made one of the worst decisions you can make. I took a moped, a Vespa, age 15, and I crashed into a car. And my leg was damaged beyond repair. And the doctor, my dad said to the doctor, my son is a soccer player. How long until he can play again? And the doctor's words were, play, we're just going to try to get him to walk again. And this is 15 years old. Wow. And so between 15 and 17, I could hardly walk, and my dream was gone. I decided I'm not going to be a pro soccer player. And then until I met the Lord at 17, the first thing the Lord ever did for me was he told me, you will play. But now it's like when he met the guys in the boat. Peter's a fisherman. He's got a fisher, a business. And... Matthew and these guys. And Jesus meets him and goes, now I will make you fishers of men. You're still going to fish, but it's not to pay your bills anymore. It's for right. other people. So he said to me, before you wanted to play soccer so you could pay your bills. Now you're going to be a soccer player of men. You're going to use the same gift, but it's for other people now. And that's what I'm doing today. Like many people, they have a dream, but then they have a lot of excuses why they cannot achieve the, the, the dream, yeah. because the excuses is a lot more level of passion. Yeah. So your so level of passion must be greater passion. over exceeding amount of the level of those excuses. That's what it is? Yes, passion is the key. In all of this, if you're not passionate, it's the key. Um, I like the verse about Jesus. The week before he died, he comes to Jerusalem. It says he set his eyes like flint to his destination. Flint is the sharpest stone, so he was focused on where he was going. They were here screaming and stuff, and his eyes were focused on where he was going, and that's passion. Once someone said one time, if every single thing had to be considered before we begin, nothing would ever begin. And so I just go ahead. I don't know what I'm doing. I just trust God, live by faith. I just go ahead. And so many obstacles. As soon as you decide to be somebody, everybody shows up and tries to make you nobody. But I'm so, I believe so much in what God has called me to do that my passion actually breaks the opposition for me. You had support from your parents? Yes. Did they actually believe in your dream? They did up until 15. Then well, until you broke your leg. Then everybody said, this ain't, isn't going to happen. Yeah. And because I was that limping. That was like a sign from God. It's you should gone. not play. Yeah. People told me, go into education, study the ministry, study theology, study this. And I was actually going that way. And the Lord told me to leave school. And so when I left school, I couldn't run properly. And they said, why are you leaving school? I said, the Lord told me I'm going to play pro soccer. Wow. And they said, you are crazy. I said, the Lord is going to do this for me. <laughs> and I left school. I went against my parents, against my friends, against because it, was, it wasn't the logical decision. And I went against myself. I didn't want to do it. It wasn't safe, but I put myself out there. I had no income, no job, nothing, 17 years old, but except a vision from God. Okay, so now we have to summarize it. It's yeah. a lot. Uh, so vision, it, it's driven by that passion. passion. Yeah. Is it possible that passion could turn into the obsession? When I talk about the obsession, I mean it becomes your idolatry, yeah. the yeah. item that you cherish more than God. Even God, yeah, absolutely. The, the thing I like about God is this. God always gives you a vision that you could never do without him. And the reason, I asked God one time, why is the vision so big? This is impossible. What, you, what you're asking me to do is impossible. He says, I make it impossible so you have to depend on me. If I gave you a vision you could accomplish, you would say, thank you very much, God, and then you go and do it and take the credit for yourself. And so right. I believe if we, that the second you lose sight of God, because God would never take my gift away. I could turn against God tomorrow morning and I could still play soccer. He would never take it away. The second you go from that, you lose your effectiveness. 
Well, uh, I agree with, about that, that at some point we do realize the lim uh, our limitation. Limit. We do re realize yeah. that. But then what occupies your mind and uh, what, uh, what I understand, the passion, is that you, you have that uh, subject yeah. that starts occupying your mind. And many people tend to believe that it's, not Im it's, it's impossible to achieve something significant like you have achieved in your life yeah. unless you literally, literally obsess with that. Yeah. I think obsession is good to an extent. As long as it doesn't take the place of God, it's good. I, as a soccer player, are very passionate. I, till this day, I play every day before my injury. Two hours of training with the team, and then I stay back for 20 minutes, 25 minutes by myself working on the game. I go home, I'm watching videos. I, go, I, I need to know, it's, my, it's what I'm called to do. So I have to study it, I gotta know what to do. But I never let that take the place of God. The second I do that, is the day I start failing, I believe. I remember a friend of mine that I went to, go, uh, to, to school together. Yes. Uh, he was very passionate about one sport, which is motocross. Oh, yeah. And then one day he gave his life to Jesus. And then later he realized that one of the conditions to follow Jesus, you have to put him on the center of your desires, on the center of your life. He struggled with that so much that he ended up actually leaving the church. Wow. Something about my friend, he's very honest, he hates hypocrisy, so therefore he said, I don't want to lie to myself until I figured it out. But my mind actually, each, each minute, because in order for, to, to be the best, it's, you have to r literally occupy your mind. Yeah. So he said, if I actually screen myself on the monitor, how much do I see in my heart Jesus? And how much do, wow. do I see that uh, from that monitor, how much of that do I see sport? 95% wow. I see sport because I do have to put myself into it. Otherwise, I will never make it. Yes. So he left the church. Wow. So my question is to you, do you ever test yourself test this way in how do you keep your faith vibrant? Absolutely, I think that's so important and it happened to me. When I was really young, one of the first challenges I had was the team I played on used to play on Sundays mm -hmm. and I had church on Sundays. So which one do I go to? And in the early years, I used to go to play soccer. I said, this is my gift. God gave me the talent. I've got to use it. And once I made that decision, I knew it was the right decision at the time for me because I still play on Sundays today sometimes. It's necessary. But at the same time, I should never, I keep, I keep people around me who are very honest with me. The second I start to put my passion or career or vision above God, I have people who will tell me, stop this, get back right. And so I'm in a position where whatever God says to do, I do. I can't lose that number one focus in my life. I'm afraid to lose it. But the question, how do you actually test yourself? How do you test yourself that you say to yourself, okay, Steve, you are yeah. normal, not right? Or, oh no, you crossed the line. Yeah. How do you actually test? Or do, do you ever cross that line or you never cross that line? If you tell me you never cross, I don't believe you. I've crossed it many times. Every Sunday, I do an inventory of my life. I check my life. What did I spend my time on this week? How much time was spent watching YouTube videos of the great soccer players? <laughs> How much time was spent in the world? How much time was spent at training? How much time was spent in prayer? So I test where my time is going. And the second soccer is double, triple. The time I spent with God, something's wrong. I'm off balance. So I check myself many times. I'm doing pretty good now, but I've had many times where it's like, man, 25 hours on soccer, three hours on God, something ain't right. right. So yeah. I'm a from conservative background myself, and there yes. is many people who actually listen to us. And one of the things that we were taught, that we could not play professionally. Oh, yeah. We could not. Because automatically that's assumption yeah that this is the source of uh, the, the game become, still replace Jesus for the source of the, the food you receive in the spiritual food. Mm -hmm. What is the game for you? The game for me is a platform, nothing more, nothing less. It gives me an audience, it gives me a voice. Now what I say with that voice or do with that voice is up to me, but it gives me a voice. LeBron James has a voice. Um, every entertainer, a Hollywood actor, they have a voice. And so all it is is a platform. Now the voice is up to you what you're gonna say. And so it's not against Jesus, it's not for Jesus. It's neither one, it's just a platform. But now it's what you do with that platform that now tests whether you're with Christ or against Christ. So I had friends too who couldn't play soccer, couldn't play basketball, couldn't do track because their parents says this is against our denomination, against our belief system. And I told them for me, it's just a platform. 
God is not for soccer. He's, God doesn't support Real Madrid or Barcelona. He doesn't care. It's just a platform. But what I do with that platform is now up to me. But how do you feel when you see your, uh, your picture all over Seattle? I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I feel good. Yeah. that become the source of feeding your, your, your ego? Very much can, it definitely can. You have, you have to guard against that, you have to. You can't get your value from that. Okay, Steve, you talk to yourself sometimes, yes. right? Yes, uh, all the so time. You, <laughs> so you, you say, well, Steve, did you last or you, you gained from this experience? I've gained, I've gained. gained. At the beginning, my, my significance, when you're a soccer player, whatever you do in life, we get our significance from what we do. And so when God takes that, or God allows that to be taken, my significance goes with it, if my significance isn't that. Right. But if my significance is just in God, no one can ever take God. And so no one can ever take my significance. So the peer pressure, like comparing yourself to others, like if you compare yourself to Messi, or, uh -huh, or some of the big names, <laughs> how do you, how do you to... still uh, recover yourself to keep yourself original, original, but, Zakwani? I believe that's the key word. Um, when I find myself in Christ, I knew that what God has given me, he gave to me and no one else can do it. Before I met Christ, you always compare. You worry, this guy's better, I want to be better than that guy. This guy's, you always worry about that. But when you find yourself in Christ, you become so original and so unique, there's no competition. You can't do what I can do, I can't do what you can do. So I appreciate your gift, but I love myself too much, I love my gift. And so I compete with no one, I have no jealousy, no envy, nothing, because I understand what I'm called to do, only I can do it. And so that's where my significance comes from, my uniqueness comes from, and my originality comes from. The God-given purpose on my life, no one else can do it. And so I respect everybody's gifts, everybody's talent, but my peace comes from knowing that God always makes originals. He never makes doubles or copycats, never. God makes originals. So yeah. I, I only, I have my fingerprints, nobody else. And so right. I love myself, so I have no competition with anybody. Let's talk about your physical recovery. Yes. Uh, we live in our world. We don't know what's going on in your world. Yes. Um, uh, I know there is a lot of discipline goes into be where you are, regardless, even for this injury. Yes. Let's talk about what's, what discipline play, what kind of role discipline plays in your life. I will never lie. This is the hardest thing I ever went through in my life. It's been the best thing, but it's also been the hardest thing. The question is, will my leg ever get better? If it does, can I ever play how I used to? God, why? Why me? Why this? These are normal questions you have. But I finally decided that there's some things in life you can never answer. There's no explanation. I didn't cause this. I didn't ask for this. It just happened. And so that gives me peace. I can sleep at night now because I can't answer this. So I won't try to answer it. Otherwise, I can't sleep. Years ago, I figured out that God never sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I have a problem I can't solve today, I go to sleep. There's no point in both me and God being up. <laughs> Let one of us solve it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how my problems work. I don't, so now I don't even think anymore. Will I come back? Will I not? Will I not? I have so much peace. I'm working everything I can physically to get back. Spiritually, I stay in check. But even if it doesn't happen, I still will have peace. So the need for fe uh, feeling significance, we, you can actually feed that from, your, uh, from the sport. Oh, man. Yes. And the way we test it. We actually, you were, uh, you were with nothing, you were broken down, and then you realize the only, the, on, the only God who actually could feed my need for that significance. And that's how you tested, and that's how you uh, came and you feel strong right now, feel in strong. spirit and in, in body. physically as well, Jesus, body as well. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, the devil has desired to sift you like wheat. He wants to destroy you, but I've prayed for you. So I'm reading this, I'm saying, what did God pray for Peter for? He says, I've prayed that your faith would fail not. You might lose your ministry, mm -hmm. you might lose the fishing business, you might lose your marriage, you might lose everything. But I pray that your faith will not fail. And so that was a prayer for me. I might lose my career, I could lose money, I could lose my car, it doesn't matter. God prays that my faith, my belief in him won't fail. Uh, share with us, what, what do you consider your greatest achievement in life? I believe my greatest achievement in life, the best thing that's happened to me is when Jesus Christ found me, because he gave me direction. But my greatest achievement in life so far has been having the courage to believe God, wow. leave home at 18, no money, no anything, and coming to the United States, believing that God told me you will play again when I could hardly run. 
that took a lot of courage. I look back on that and I remember the laughter, people saying it couldn't happen. And then I sit down here now, I was the, I, in college the second year, I led the nation in scoring the most goals. Then I was drafted the number one pick in the draft. And that was just four years after my injury, the first pick in the draft. And so I believe that one decision I made where I said, I don't understand all the details. I don't know how, but I'm just going to believe you, God. I'm just going to believe God. And I think that decision I made, it keeps me very humble to see what the Lord has done in my life. And it gets me excited because if he's done this, then anything else he tells me, he has the power and the ability to do it too. And so my life is very simple. Just believe God. Whatever God says to do, I need to do. And so I keep myself there. I appreciate the achievements I've had in my soccer career. And people message me and say, we heard you preach here and it was great. I really do love that. But none of it is possible if I disobeyed God when I was 17 years old.